For more on market risk and lessons learned from the financial crisis, joining us now is Robert Greifeld, the former NASDAQ CEO who led the exchange during the crisis and currently is a Virtu Financial's chairman and co-founder of North Island. Bob, it's great to see you again. Great feedback, Melissa. Um, what has changed? Uh, you know, technology certainly has changed a lot in the past 10 years. How has that made uh, things different in terms of pre preventing the next crisis? Well, I think there's a whole different regulatory infrastructure in place. But I would just start by thinking back 10 years ago, I realized how naive I was and I think others, because I remember the date that Bear Stearns got bailed out by the government and J.P. Morgan, and we thought at that time the crisis was contained. But what we didn't realize is that other parties, other parties that had been valid counterparties, now in the eyes of others had been reduced in terms of their viability. And everybody spent the next number of months figuring out who was going to be the next Bear Stearns and assumed everybody would be. And the end state of that, it devolved into the point where the only valid counterparty was the U.S. government. So clearly we learned through Bear Stearns that the world is so interconnected and an issue in one will sp uh, spread like a contagion across the financial system. What was it like, uh, you know, 10 years ago when you were head of the NASDAQ uh, to go through those days where trading volumes were skyrocketing, where stocks were just being taken to the woodshed? What was it like, Bob? Well, it was uh, certainly interesting uh, and at points uh, terrifying. What we saw in the equity markets was transactional volume that we had only tested in the lab. So we would typically have three times the capacity on hand, and normally in a busy day you increase your volume by 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. But now we had systems that were essentially redlined because laboratory testing conditions were now existing in real life. And I'm proud to say the equity markets held up very well. Obviously we did not like the results of the price movement, but the fact is the markets performed uh, very well and functioned. And that was, I think, in stark contrast to the over-the-counter market, but we came through that without any systems issues, with the integrity of the market in place. Now, Bob, uh, we continue to see new cycle highs in all kinds of metrics. Today, it's uh, University of Michigan uh, back above 100, a long way from where we were uh, fall in the early days of the crisis. H how would you characterize the way we're set up for growth, uh, the way this cycle can be elongated? What needs to happen now? Well, I think under the current administration, we have to give them credit, one, for the deregulatory environment that we have. That will definitely help uh, accelerate growth. The tax plan, I think, is going to be a wonderful tonic for growth in this country. My particular concern is these two pro-growth initiatives are somewhat counterbalanced by an immigration policy, which is backward looking. If we look forward, we see that we have currently full employment. And as these growth policies come into place, we're going to need people. Right? We're going to need additional people to fuel the growth that now the economy can realize. And when you're in full employment, you don't definitely have to look for immigration policy that encourages people to come into this country. So I think if we look forward for immigration, it's really the reversal of where we've been in the past. Right? We're going to need more people. If we're going to grow at 3%, there certainly has to be more qualified people coming into this country. Uh, on a consistent basis. So I see this imbalance which will impact and certainly I think somewhat negatively affect our ability to grow in the years to come. Uh, Bob, you know, back to um, lessons and current concerns. We had Gary Parr join us not too long ago and we asked him what is his main threat or concern that he sees to the financial system. He said cyber. Uh, you know, you're a guy who spent a lot of time on systems, spent a lot of time investing in them. Obviously, a, a lot of technology companies went public on the NASDAQ. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do. But I want to step back, you know, from the lessons learned from 10 years ago and back to my example where we thought Bear Stearns was going to be contained. We have to make sure that when you have a failure of one, it's not seen as the failure of the many. Right, so I think we have a great resolution authority in place today, but it has not been tested in real life. So the only way the financial system gets into trouble like it did 10 years ago is if we think this will be a flu that affects everybody. With respect to cyber, I think we're going to live in the cyber threat environment till the next wave of technology comes forward. I think we're three to five years away from that. 
There are ways where you're going to see systems designed where they cannot be hacked the way systems are today. So certainly for the next three to five years, I agree with Gary's assessment. I think the vendors that are available today compared to 10 years ago are light years ahead, but clearly the threat vectors increase on a regular basis, and it's something we have to deal with. When you're talking about systems that cannot be hacked, are you talking about the blockchain, Bob? Well, I, I think blockchain could be one example of that, but I'm saying, you know, pervasively through the entire computing and network environment, you have to build from the ground up to ensure your systems are secure. So blockchain certainly had that in mind. But understand the computer designers, right, 10 years ago, and we're still living in the advent of the von Neumann architecture, they did not think of security first, right? So the next generation of equipment will be built first and foremost with security. So in the past, we've thought about the speed of the processor, the speed of the I.O., how can we get the computer to work faster? Now we're going to make sure that first and foremost, the first design objective is that this thing is secure. So we're going to enter ah. that generation. I think we'll see a different world. The notion that we somehow are able to box in hackers, uh, some might think is overly optimistic, Bob. Well, I think if you stand here today, you'd have to agree with that assessment. But I'm saying as we get to the next generation and have you know the talented design engineers built it, from the ground up, and this will have some impact on performance, right? So what we can do now from a design perspective is not, was not possible years ago because the overhead on the systems, the inherent overhead on the systems is so great. But now when we have an excessive amount of compute and memory capability, we can, you know, look at it as having unlimited resources to get a dedicate to security, right? So we didn't have that focus 10 years ago, nor did we have the technology. But you look at the chip, technology it's developing, the memory technology, you have these resources, you can dedicate them uh, to be a secure environment. All right, Bob, we're going to leave it there. It's great speaking with you. Okay. Okay. Thank Bob you, Greifeld. Melissa. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.